Okay, well, uh, we would like to welcome you all to our uh, first webinar for 2022 on the intensity trail. Um, we'll quickly um, introduce ourselves, the instructors. Um, Jackie, you're, <laughs> we'd like you to also introduce yourself. <laughs> um, Jackie, just one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I'll start with myself. Um, my name is Heidi. Um, I'm part of Long Island Search and Rescue. I'm the team leader with Long Island Search and Rescue. I'm also um, an instructor with INBTI and an evaluator. And I was running a Bloodhound, and she's 11 now. We just got a porcelain. They're 11, 10, 10 and a half or 11 weeks old. So they're interesting. <laughs> a lot of work right now. Um, and um, yeah, so we're here to help you guys out and show you a little bit about what that intensity trail is about. Ed? And I'm Ed Hajek, and um, also an instructor for IMBTI and evaluator, and also a uh, member of Long Island Search and Rescue. Um, I run a six year old bloodhound, and now I also have a porcelain. <laughs> so, uh, like Heidi said, we're here to help you guys out, you know whatever, anytime you guys have questions or anything like that, just let us know, okay? Who's next? Monica or Chris. Okay, hi, uh, some of you already know me. Uh, my name is Monica, Monica Diaz. I am from Spain, from Barcelona, currently living in Lleida. And uh, I started man trailing in 2014. I was lucky to, to participate in a Kevin Cocker seminar. I was really, really lucky. And uh, and uh, from there, my passion for man trailing started. I just let me mute some people. Okay, now. And uh, from then on, I've been learning and learning and traveling and meeting all these amazing instructors and uh, amazing people all over the world because I'm fortunate uh, to, to, to be able to travel. And I will travel again when COVID allows it, meeting a lot of people and sharing sharing what we know because that's part of the philosophy of the of the IMBTI is sharing everything that we know to to everybody that that is interested and wants to learn. Chris, okay, I am Chris Boyd. I'm from uh, Madison, Wisconsin, USA. I've been doing um, IMBTI for about twenty years, and uh, well, doing trailing and tracking of dogs um, for about 25 years. I am a retired police officer, a canine supervisor uh, from a police department that we had uh, started. I started the program, we ended up with eight dog teams and I worked primarily with um, shepherds and Malinois and Dutch shepherds. But now I'm working a um, search and rescue dog uh, that is a Bavarian mountain hound, it's my first dog. And I work on, um, two different search and rescue teams. So I love trailing. It's my, my favorite thing to teach. It's the most difficult, but also the most rewarding. So thank you. Uh, something happened to the to Bernard. <laughs> I, <laughs> I hope happened. you hear me. Oh, we yes. hear you, we don't yes. see you. Okay. Um, I don't know, I get the message. The host stopped my video. Okay, <laughs> wait, I, wait, wait, I, wait. Maybe wait, I, I have one. Maybe okay. I did, but it's Here I, I, didn't I, am want again. <laughs> I didn't want to do it. Sorry, okay. Bernard, sorry. So, hello, everybody. Uh oh, he froze. I come from Austria, Europe, police officer, uh, dog handler, canine dog handler, and the police for 30 years. Um, always, uh, we have multiple post dogs, so petrol dogs and also search dogs. Um, I have my, four, my fourth. Uh, police dog now. Um, I meet Kevin in, I think, 2010 about this. And then I hear his uh, explanation of what the dog is doing on a trek or on the trail. I recognize that uh, real case tracking is nearly the same like trailing. It's only to build up the dogs is a little bit different. And since uh, 2040, uh, 14, <laughs> I am uh, I'm the instructor, and I try to help others uh, to understand what main trailing is and how to build up a good main trailing dog. And Jackie, I mean, 
Hi, yes, I got your message, but you're welcome to please introduce yourself to you're one of our instructors. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jackie. I'm the instructor for, I guess, Africa at the moment. Um, so I've got teams in South Africa, and I'm currently working out of Iswatini, which is a neighboring country to South Africa, and met this lovely bunch of IMBTI people what, 2016, I think, was the first time I went there. I've been privileged to train under most of you and with some of you. And yeah, we're here to help. It's exciting to see so many people join. So um, my connection is not so stable. You guys may hear me or may not. So does anybody want to start with explaining what the intensity trail is, just in case my thing goes off? What do you want me to do? You can do it. Don't matter. Okay. So most of you guys are probably familiar, hopefully, with the um, with the Coker method and also have the book. Um, is it the book? Um, if you do have the book and you have and you're not familiar with the intensity trail, it is chapter 10. I believe it is chapter 10 in all the languages, Spanish, German. Um and Hungarian, right? And English. So the intensity trail, this is the foundation of all of our work. The best way to describe it, when you have an athlete and our dogs are our athletes, if it's an athlete that is in a football stadium or, um, or handball, they have to constantly do repetitive exercises in order to maintain their level, such as running around the track. The intensity trail is the dog's foundational exercise. We do this to introduce brand new dogs to man trailing. We do this to maintain their foundation and build on their foundation. Oh God, stop. And also to introduce new components. And yeah. Anybody want to jump in, please? <laughs> um, yeah, I will, um, I will add that um, the intensity is something that we use throughout the dog's entire career. And I have had the experience of being able to watch dogs work their entire career on cases and police work. And you can definitely tell when people stop using intensities because intensities keep the dog's motivation and focus on that job. And when we stop doing that, and we get into longer trails, the dogs get bored, they get, they start to critter, they start to, you start to see these behaviors that you don't see when you have a dog maintaining intensities throughout their entire career. So it's very important because it's not natural for dogs to trail people, you know, and we have to remember that, that we have to keep it a motivation for them and um, in, in addition to that, we'll talk about the reward at the end, but um, the intensity in itself is supposed to maintain that focus and that drive. Yeah. I, I think this is uh, something that people don't quite understand the intensity trail. This is why we are doing this, because I think as far as I, I know in, uh, in all the places that I see, some people don't understand the importance of it and uh, how you can do it to adjust it to every dog. So I think maybe we can discuss a little bit this. Jelly. Yeah, because uh, I think it's people, to me, some people say, I don't need intensities or my dog is too, high, too highly motivated, doesn't need intensities, but. Well, okay, yeah. so we'll, we'll start with our situation and Monica right now is in the, in the same um, boat with um, Taxi. So we're, we're all building up puppies. And in order to, when you introduce this method, when you introduce man trailing to puppies or brand new dogs, we start off with the intensity trail. Um, what does that mean? That means that, or well, I'm gonna physically tell you how you do this. So you grab a scent article of the person that's gonna be running, being your runner. You have the reward for the dog. Hopefully it's the best thing ever for the dog. And you're going to tease the dog up with that 
with that object that or that food or that toy that is amazing for the for the uh, dog. Drop the scent article in front of the dog's nose, and the dropping of the scent article is ninety five percent of the dogs. So we'll say that that motion of dropping it makes the dog connect the scent article to the trail. I'm sorry, to the person, sorry. Then the runner will run and the handler will take the dog and move the dog away from the direction of trail. Then as soon as they're hidden in, we're, we're talking, what, 35, uh, 30 to 60 seconds. It should not be anything real long. You give your dog the take send command, you give your dog the work command, and you go. Now, again, this is very simplified. Every dog, we ha may have to tweak things, do things a little bit different, but this is the basic idea of how to do a, an intensity trail. Also, what I didn't mention, I apologize to everybody. <laughs> um, when you start your trail, you should throw that scent article on the ground and do a circle. In the beginning, that circle for that intensity trail is going to just serve for the handler to kind of get that motion of doing a scent inventory, even though it's not necessary for an intensity trail. But it also gives the dog the opportunity to go to the bathroom and get all of that stuff out of the way. Smell the critter, do, ever, do all of the stuff that they should not be doing before they put that harness on them. That's a very broad explanation. Now, somebody can add to it. You want? Um, I would say that, you know, there's probably most of the people that are here in the um, presentation have a basic understanding of the intensity. And, but there are a lot of things that can be learned in terms of all the different variations that people will need to see you know, and understand so that they can be more successful than one because when you first start doing these, the dog is learning like what's going on, you know, and then as the dog picks it up, you have changes in how to present the intent. We have some background noise. Yeah, I'm trying to find who is this. Uh, yes, now. Okay. You can mute, mute, mute yourself if you're not speaking. Thank you. Um, so, so there's different uh, personalities in these dogs. We look at the personality of your dog. You look at the drives of your dogs and you look at the maturity and that changes. And so when those things change, we have to make some changes, sometimes the intensity. Some dogs have a higher um, visual drive because they're visual hunters. And so we have to pay attention to that, you know, when we're presenting it. And sometimes the smallest things that we do in our intensities make a really big difference for the dog, you know? And I'll start off with, when you start to start your intensity and you put your article down, even with the young dog, let the dog see it, the, not the article, but the scent article and the harness. A lot of people will start that way. The dog, it gets that information right away this is gonna be my start area. And that's why we do that. You know, every part of the intensity, there's a reason for it. You know, every part of it. So you put, put it down so the dog knows where the start area is. And you'll recognize a change in behavior when the dog starts working an area around those articles that are on the ground. Um, the length of the intensity will change. In the beginning, when you're teaching a young dog, the length of the intensity is very short. But as you mature, you're going to add some things. You're going to add length to it. You may do an intensity where the scent article is not placed right by the start, but within the circle. And that's, you, you make these variations as you move along. So um, we're here to kind of present the ideas and why these ideas are beneficial in the long run, because you're always looking for what are we going to do at the end game? The end game for me might be that I have to walk my dog around a house so that I can find where the freshest odor is. 
of a child that lives in that house. So that's my inventory circle, you know, and the dog is searching for the freshest order because we don't know what it, where it is. And so that's the purpose of doing the circle. Some dogs are resistant to the circle and you have to give them time to get used to it. Um, and, and a lot of times what I'll tell people when I see them is like, what's the question? When do you start after doing the inventory circle? And the answer, I'll tell you the answer is when the dog is ready, not when we're ready. You know, it's when the dog is ready to start. And so you make your decision about what the area is gonna be and you do a passive direct into that area, let the dog inspect. If the dog is interested in something within that inventory circle, let them finish it. Because if you don't let them finish it, they wanna go back to it after you start, after you put the harness on. So I know I have a hound dog, very, very stubborn. If he doesn't finish smelling something, he's gonna protest, you know? And so, and then other dogs, I've had shepherds where they want to get down to business. They want to go, you know, but at the same time, they do have to do the circle. So they're a little quicker starters, but every dog is a little bit different. And we have to um, develop these, these starts in our trainings, according to the dog, according to their personality, their drives, their maturity level. So just to throw that out there to get us started. And Chris, you bring up a really important point. When we're working with these dogs, and you're going to be doing intensities throughout the dog's career, you need to pay attention to your dog's body language. You need to really, this is a team. This is not just you telling your dog what to do. It's understanding your dog's body language, understanding when your dog needs something. So oh, yeah. as, as Chris said, um, pay attention. I mean, if you're teasing up the dog, or if you're having your subject tease up the dog, and that tail is going in, what do you think you have to do? You gotta be a, be a little calmer. Don't don't get so crazy. Don't tease them so that they they're freaking out because they're never gonna want to work like that. So pay attention to these things. And this is something maybe we don't talk about enough about it about the runner. The, the the role of the runner in the intensity is crucial. It's very important yeah. that the dog the runner has to all, also observe the dog and uh, also guided by the by the handler who knows the dog very well. They, uh, the runner has to figure out how to tease the dog, how to motivate the dog without overwhelming the dog, without disturbing the dog, because the moment you tease the dog can be very, should be very exciting for the dog and motivating, but it can also be very intimidating maybe or uncomfortable for some dogs. So I think that we, we don't talk enough about the role of the runner when teasing the dog and when rewarding the dog as well. This is not a webinar to talk about the runner, but it's... It's crucial. It's very, very important. Yeah. And I think that people have to understand when you're the handler, you're in charge of your team. At that point, you're in charge of your training. So if your runner is not doing what it should, if your runner is overwhelming your dog, if your runner <laughs> made the intensity trail too short, you as the handler, you will, if, it, if it's too short, for example, well, I'm going to have you run again. You'll learn. <laughs> you won't do it that short because guess what? The next intensity, you're going to run one more intensity until we get it right. So don't be afraid if you are the handler. Don't be afraid to correct your runner. This is your training and they're helping you. And you guys as a team, you want to you wanna get better, not, not um, satisfy the runner. <laughs> you you want to... Yeah make your no, team as, as powerful as you can. So no, these are the things that uh, you have to, before you start uh, running the trail, you have to discuss very clearly with the handler and runner have to discuss and have to, the runner has to explain how to reward, how to motivate or tease the dog and everything, because we want this to be a great experience for the dog. If the dog doesn't have a good experience, I mean, we're not doing anything. I mean, it's bullshit. So we really right. have to be sure that the dog is really, we prepare everything so that the dog is successful and that the dog has a good time doing it. Because this is, this is the way the dog will want to do it again in the future. So. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe I can tell something about the intensity. Yeah. Why we do the intensity. This is a very important point. Uh, people often doesn't understand why we do the intensity and how we do the intensity. And so if we look to the dog, the intensity, or when we talk about main trailing, uh, it's only for the dog's sight, it is a hunt. 
not more. Uh -huh. And on this hand, we have his uh, parade drive. We need his parade drive. We need his motivation. And the dog needs to know uh, why he is on hunt because of the reward, uh, the rabbit at least. Uh, and so we, if we understand that the intensity is a very simple and high motivated hunt, then everything, everything will be explained by itself. And Kevin Kocher was very good in explaining uh, uh, difficult uh, things from Kynologic in very simple words to the people to, that they can understand this. Uh, and uh, this is uh, sometimes for other people a little bit confused because they don't understand what Kevin means with this. And uh, so the intensity is a little hunt. So we have the key stimulus where the rabbit appears. Uh, he disappears, he is running away. The dog knows, okay, I have to catch the rabbit because this is my food. I live for this food. Then you have to search for the rabbit. And at least when he have the rabbit and he catch the rabbit and then uh, he eat the food and <laughs> then he bring some food back to the back to the pack. I hope I, I, I spelled it yes. right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, and then he feed the pack with this. And if we see this in the base of what uh, intensity is, you will recognize that intensity is a little hunt with a simple a bit different explanation what we do, that's all. Uh, the second thing is <clears throat> why we do the intensity. I often recognize uh, people go on trail, very long trails and very difficult trails sometimes. And then the dog got, uh, becomes weaker and weaker. And then the people say, okay, uh, we have to do a motivation trail or intensity. So the motivation goes up uh, with this dog. And I always ask why you wait with the dog. The dog gets weak and then you have to do a motivation. So why you don't do every time a motivation though the dog has a good motivation when it goes on a difficult trail. The people have to understand that the intensity or the small uh, hunt is the basic of the whole motivation for the dog to hunt for people. That's all. And uh, adding an in a short intensity after a difficult, long or challenging trail, uh, it's, it's something that is also very powerful and people sometimes underestimate them. And they finish a long or difficult trail and they, they don't add that intensity trail at the end, which I think that to me, it's very important because uh, it, it, it helps understand the dog that after a difficult ch and challenging trail, there is always a celebration and a good find at the end. So I think it's important that people remember that when you do a difficult exercise, you also have to add an intensity trail at the end because yeah, it I helps. Think, Sorry. Yeah, I think it's something that, that everybody forgets is that when you set up your training, remember we had the slides, the IMBTI slides that show you how you set up your trail, whether or not it's a call out trail or, or what, or a practice trail or a component, you should be thinking about your starts. What kind of start are you going to use? In this, this case, we're talking about intensity starts, but there are others. Um, then the type of component or components. And then the third part of the trail is the intensity. We always hang an intensity on at the end because that revs them back up again. Okay. Um, but, what we, but, sorry, no, 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 we no, haven't I talked about with the intensity trail. Um, I'm sorry. No, no, it's okay. I, I, I can't hear. I can I, 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 you froze. You suddenly froze and I couldn't hear you. No. I, yeah, I couldn't hear you either. Yeah. No, I just wanted to say that. Uh, if somebody uh, rides horses, they they may know that probably in show jump, when before the dog leaves, uh, they always jump a small jump, an easy one before leaving. Or in, uh, in agility, they also usually when they finish, they also make a, like a small jump, an easy one, because they understand that the dog has to leave the area with a good end at the end. So this is what we do in in uh, man training with the, our intensities. It's like this aftertaste <laughs> that 
keeps you wanting more at the end. And uh, right. other sports with dogs or with other animals, they do it because they understand that the animal needs to lead or the finish the exercise with a good impression. Or if you're training something with a dog, you always end up with something easy at the end because you want the dog to go back home or back uh, with a good thing at the end in his mind, with a success for, uh, in the end of the training. So this, this makes complete sense for us in the mantelling as well, in the way we do it. I don't know if this is clear. No, it, to me it's clear. I don't, I, I, <laughs> it's saying that my internet connection is unstable. So I don't know what everybody can hear. You guys hear? Yes. Mon Monica, you hear? Okay. Um, I'd like yeah, to add and, and, uh, something to, about the intensities. Um, we just got a, a question in on this and I think it's a really big issue. I know it is with dogs that have really high drive. And once they learn the game, it doesn't take long before now you have a dog who is just going bonkers, you know? And how do we do that with intensities? Mm -hmm. um, I know that with my current dog, you know, I did not do a lot of excitement. I did not have my runners you know, like show the toy, you know, and, and show, show the dog that, you know, that what they're going to do. I said, walk in front of the dog, um, show the reward, you know, and then stand there. And as soon as you turn your dog around, then walk oh, yes. away. Title. And I say, don't even run in the beginning. Cause I don't want the dog listening to you. I want the dog to just listen to me. And I talked dog and I said oh you're gonna find somebody you're gonna find I calm the dog down a little bit because I know that if he's in too high a drive turns around he's too excited he's using his eyes he's not using his nose um, and so you have to kind of gear the set the stage for your dog to be able to focus and this is what Bernard was talking about they have to be able to focus think use their nose at the same time have have like the desire to follow that person and to get to the end. And it's like, it's a balancing act. It's a, it's a balancing act. And there's things that you can do. Um, at the end of my trails, I'm playing with my dog and I've already told my runner, when I'm playing with my dog, I want you just to walk away, you know? And then the dog will walk away and I'll take the toy and go like, where'd he go? You know, and then he does the intensity trail. But I've had dogs too, where the dog has seen the person in a different, points of your training, you will change this. You know, you change it and provide the dog what it needs to be able to concentrate and focus and not lose their mind. Because when they are too excited and too, and too amped up, they, they're not even using their nose. So right. it's, it's really an art. This is really an art. Art and science mixed. Yeah. <laughs> as, as, as a matter of fact, I think maybe the, the problem here is that when we talk about intensity, everybody thinks like something very intense and it doesn't have to be super intense. It's, less, it's, right. just, it's just like showing the runner shows the dog the food or the toy and says, I've got this. Come and get me. It's like, hey, we start the game. You see this, but you can do this just by showing it to, to the dog. No need to just jump or scream or anything. So you have to balance this. Right. And this is the magic thing about mantrailing. No dog is equal. Um, Monica, maybe can you can show the, the sheet with the yes. tables? Yes. Uh, nice. Let me share. Let me let yeah. me share the screen uh, with you guys. Uh, this one. Is this one? Um... Wait. Oh, ah, wait, yes. Ah, yes. Yeah, that's okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's great. So. Uh, when we talk about uh, the start and the intensity, I always split uh, the excitement and the drive in different uh, positions like the drive. The drive is something a dog has or have, have not. It's a prey drive we need for this work and we can tune the prey drive a little bit, but if the dog doesn't have a prey drive, we cannot uh, uh, um, create it. Um, this is what I always different between drive and motivation. So drive is something the dog have or have not, uh, or have more or have less. Uh, the second thing is uh, the motivation. The motivation is this where we can build a very good motivation. This is we can create for the dog. Uh, 
the motivation that the dog wants to find the runner. This is the main target in this uh, whole game we play. Um, and so I different this to the drive because the intensity is uh, the tool where we can create a very good motivation for the dog to find the runner. Uh, the third thing is, and this is uh, the most time people will forget, this is the concentration of the dog. Uh, I don't have, um, it doesn't, um, how shall I explain it? Uh, it doesn't work if the dog has a very good drive and a very motivation, but it doesn't concentrate on or take the focus on the work, what he has to do. So we will never reach the, the target because uh, the dog is too too high uh, drive to overdrive to like this, but not concentrated on his work with the nose. And at least it, it's uh, the excitement, the excitement, the positive excitement for the dog uh, that I tell the dog, okay, now we do a very good game and this is very positive for you. And this is where we can push uh, the dog's excitement in a very positive way. Uh, the next one, please, Monica. The most time I see the dogs, they have the level, they have not so much drive, not so much motivation, very less concentration and the excitement is, okay, very good. Uh, this is not very good because uh, with low motivation and low concentration, I will never reach the target. So also if the drive would be at the point 10, uh, I will not reach the target or the goal because the motivation and the concentration is too low. So, and the third one, please, Monica. I always recognize when we have high driven dogs, um, they have a good drive, they have also a good motivation, but at start they have a less concentration and often a very high excitement. And then, then the dog fails on the start because they are not focused on the work they have to do. Uh, and so if you see this sheet and uh, maybe you understand what is important for the whole game, it's uh, that all uh, uh, bars are very equal. So the, the drive has to be good, the concentration has to be good, the motivation has to be good, and the excitement has to be good. That's a very important thing of the intensity. For work, when you work with the dog in intensity, then you will maybe understand uh, what is uh, the sense of this. Okay, thank you for sharing. Uh, you you you're mute, Monica. You're mute. Yes. Ah. Now, <laughs> thank you, Bernard. It was I think it was very clear. The problem is sometimes people don't understand, don't make the difference, though, don't understand what is motivation, yeah, sorry, what is I excitement. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Some the people... most the most time the the people think teasing is 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 the most important thing for this game so teasing the dog so if you train with uh, german shepherd or malian or uh, like this if you tease the dog too much he will bite you he never will understand what is the game so <laughs> yes. Uh, yes that's that's natural and then you have to uh, uh, think about this sheet and then we will understand okay if i have a malian or a high driven dog it's not important that i tease this dog it's more important to get the focus and, and the concentration on the work you have to do. So I have to think about how do I set up the start ritual. Maybe it's enough when I disappear without running. So exactly. if, yeah. if the dog makes the circle and when he comes back, the runner is to me. Sometimes this is enough teasing for high driven dogs. And when I talk about high driven dogs, uh, they are very high driven. So yeah. <laughs> uh, it's sometimes people mean they have a, a very high driven dog, but it isn't a high driven dog. Yeah, most um, of the most of the hounds. I mean, I know that there are some high driven hounds, but most of the hounds are not. Yes. What Bernie is talking about. <laughs> when Kevin wrote this book, this book here is based on the bloodhound. It's for everybody. But when he was talking about really tease that dog up, really tease that dog up, he's talking about the bloodhound because the bloodhound really needed that teasing. When you talk about the mouse, <laughs> there are a few mouse <laughs> that you can do that to. <laughs> so 
again, this is a framework. We want we want you to have success. And if you're not having success, you gotta you gotta look at these things and you gotta adjust to make it work for you. But don't take a dog that is a little bit excited or a little bit, you know, jazzed up at the start when you're trying to tease them and say, oh, I want it less because it's gonna pull me less. That's not what we're looking for. It's supposed to be exciting. So if you're questioning it, send a video in to one of the instructors and say, hey, is this what you're talking about? Should I be teasing my dog more or less? Or what should I be doing? And any one of uh, the instructors in IMBTI would be happy to help you out with that. Yeah, I found uh, sometimes that I, oui, somebody's, wait, let me, uh, that uh, some dogs are very expressive verbally or vocally. They express, they bark sometimes with joy and happiness. Or, or maybe because they are impatient and uh, their handler gets a bit nervous and wants the dog to shut up. But uh, sometimes I say, if, if it's barking because the dog is excited, but then, but it's he's very focused, you have to accept that as well. If you have a very barky dog, maybe he will bark uh, sometimes, not 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 like crazy, but I mean, you have to, to know your dog and allow some things for your dog, as long as the dog doesn't lose focus. But I have a like a Spanish water dog in a team that barks of happiness and joy. So you don't want to kill that. The dog is expressing yeah. and, you know. Also when, when the dog barks, there are some breeds uh, who have this in, in natural behavior. Like if you have a beagle and you know beagle, uh, yeah. beagle are hunting dogs and uh, they are very loud on, on starting or like this, but this is often natural behavior. It's not good to uh, stop this because uh, then I get pressure on the dog at the start. And this is not what I need. I need a high motivated dog at the start. So let him bark, why not? Yeah, right. Yeah, as long as you understand, know your dog well, as long as you know your dog well, because sometimes some people don't know their dogs well and they don't, don't understand if it's an anxiety bark or a stress bark or a happy, happy bark. Mm. But once you understand this, you have to allow your dog to be, to be what your dog is and be able to express happiness and joy at that moment, but because this is what you want. The problem is when a Malinois is very happy, maybe barks a lot and it's like more intimidating than a, be than a beagle. But the handler has to understand what, what is excitement, what is happiness or what is joy, you know, or stress. Yeah, and that does take time and it takes some experience with it. And once again, if you are unsure, don't guess. Email into INBTI or, or uh, message one of the instructors and we will help set you on the right path. I just want to tie in there with, with Heidi, if I may, um, and, and even you, Monica, and all of you. Um, you know, you just talked about the dogs that bark and are exciting, and, and Heidi mentioned this dog is going to take off. Well, that's actually, I find that a lot of people, that's what the dog's supposed to do. Um, <laughs> you know, I even had a little dash hunt that this little thing was pulling along. So it's not going to plod along. If the dog is plodding along, we've got a problem. And, and it's learning that skill. It's learning about handling that mm -hmm. um, drive of the dog. So um, yes, it is going, some, some are going to bark, some is going to bark for, out of breed and nature. And most of them should be taking off like a bullet out of a gun. Um, don't hold that back and, and think there's something wrong. People are, are breaking the dogs. There's ways in, in teaching that dog a good speed in yourself. You can't go, we've just had a dog do a trail two days ago, seven kilometers. Um, you're not going to sprint that, but you'll learn how to control that. Right. Yeah, that's another thing we haven't really touched on um, yet. And that's speed on intensities. So let's say we got all these things right now. And now your dog wants to go and run real fast with those intensities. Don't let them do that. <laughs> you, the, the point is not to run as fast as you can. That never was the point. We want it intense and fun, but we want the dog to be accurate on what they're doing. And you want something that is sustainable for you. You cannot run full out a one kilometer, two kilometer, four kilometer trail. So do something do something that's a, a nice trot, a nice run along, 
but don't go full out. I think that's. Um, I think it really boils down to, to muscle memory. Chris, you sorry, Chris, you were talking about that starting circle. Um, and I see so many handlers, if they like on a rally, going around that circle. Um, now we're talking about the speed of that dog on intensity and letting it get away. It, if we allow, if we do a starting circle in an intensity, running a marathon, if we let the dog run a marathon on a, or, or a speed race on intensity, you get, it, 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 it's learned behavior. So once you start getting to your delayed starts and your thin article starts, your dog is not doing what it's supposed to be on the circle because it's used to running around the circle. It takes off on a on an unmanageable unmanageable pace on a on a on a theoretical start. So it is it is a art and and learn to control that and do the right thing from the onset. I like to um, move into something else that I've seen that can be problematic in terms of the starts, and that is when you look at the drives of the dogs. You know you have dogs that may have a lot of hunt drive. You know, but hound dogs typically a lot of hunt drive. And then typically, you know, shepherds, a lot of prey drive, you know, and then there's that there's in between, you know, there's, there's a bit, there's changes in that. But when you think about doing intensity, we're also teaching the dog how to start a trail. The start of the trail is the most important part. If you do not have a good start, you do not have a trail, you know? <laughs> and so what I see a lot of times is that um, unknowingly, the handlers let the dog watch the watch the um, runner run too much, you know. And so, in the very beginning, when you're teaching a young dog, you know that hasn't done this before, you let the dog watch a couple steps, two or three steps, and then turn the dog so it doesn't see the rest, because you want the dog to use their nose. I mean, trailing is using your nose. A lot of dogs, when they turn around, uh, if, if they watch the dog too many times, what happens is you're putting a dog that has high prey drive in prey drive. And prey drive means using your eyes, you know? And so now you have a dog who turns around, they've seen the person run, so now they're looking, you know? And so you can avoid developing that problem because it's a problem. I've seen some dogs just run out away from the start. They're not following, they're looking. You know, and I want my dog, and I'm sure everybody wants their dog to turn around after that runner's gone and put their nose down and use their nose. And to be able to do that, to ensure that is once the dog gets the game, they've watched the person run two or three steps, then wait, you tell, I tell my runners, I encourage people to tell their runners, wait until I completely turn the dog around, stand still, and then, then move. You know, sometimes, I'll even use a door, you know, and I'll do the inventory circle just outside the door, just inside the door, use that to help. I always use a blocker, like a car, tree, a building, you know, so that helps when you turn the dog around, it makes it much easier to run our intensities that way. But what happens is, okay, I'm a high prey drive dog and I'm looking at somebody and they take a couple steps and I get turned around by my handler. And I turn back around and I'm looking for that person because I was just put in prey drive, you know, as opposed to, I see a person, I turn around, I turn back and I don't see them anymore. They're gone, they disappeared. Now I'm gonna put my nose down and, and smell and see where did they go? You know, and so this is really something to think about when you are um, doing your starts because that's a little thing, but that can be a very big thing when you are, now starting your starts that you don't do intensities, you're doing the inventory and the dog, you know, the dogs, the dogs, you can develop a dog that's using their eyes at the beginning. The other thing is, is that, that um, if I'm holding the leash, the dog doesn't move until he's using his nose. I just don't let him run out right away. I wanna wait until, and I can move at the dog a little bit, but I don't want them searching for odor way out there where they last saw the person. So hope that makes sense to everybody. Yeah, no, it does. That's a really important point that you're making. A lot of people are inadvertently building cues into their training with intensity trails by allowing the, the second they 
they give the take send command and the work command. As soon as the dog starts moving, they're moving too. And they're kind of pushing the dog in instead of allowing that dog to pick direction of trail and go. You want to hear, you want to feel, and Kevin would always say, you want to feel that, that lead slip through your hands and slide out. You want that dog to commit to the direction of trail and start pulling. And then you go. Not push the push the dog. Yeah, don't ever run the same speed as your dog. You gotta slow your dog down, keep that lead tight between you and the dog. But you don't want to run the same speed as your dog because you'll never be able to. Right. And you know, it's just it's just crazy. Yeah, and where the uh, Lena press, why should the handler run when in intensity? Trail, why not walk? Again, it's hard to say how fast your walk is, how how slow your run is. You're gonna have to determine your speed. No, generally you don't walk on an intensity trail, but you're not running full, full out. Um, it's a motivational thing. So walking is generally not motivational. So a light run is motivational. So it should be like a light run, not a full out run and not like a slow walk. But if your dog is, if you're running and your dog is walking, obviously you're pushing your dog. So you're not, you're not trailing. So you, you want your dog to, to keep that. You want that lead tight between you and the dog. And if the dog is like really running and you have to slow him down, then you, you have to slow him down. But you know, you want to always keep that lead tight between the two of you while you're trailing it, because this way you have control of your dog. And you'll see, yeah. And you'll see that balance of what speed you can go because if you have a very fast dog and you slow them down too much, you will build up frustration in that dog and the dog will start spinning around and doing circles. And it just, it, that, that doesn't work when the dog spins around and around and around all the way to the, all the, way to the subject. The other thing you wanna think about is what's the end game? You know, the end game is you're gonna be doing longer trails, things that you don't know, you may not know anything about the trail. And the dog has got to maintain motivation, you know, and we talked about earlier, this is a way of teaching the dog the game, but it's also the most important thing is to maintain motivation. And I know that m all of us have seen dogs that are not motivated. They're crittering, they're, you know, you're, you're cheerleading them through this trail because it's not fun anymore. And I'll tell you a story, a short story. The best trailing dog that we had in our department, in our police department, started to critter, started to show interest in other things other than the target odor of the trail. And I asked the handler, when's the last time you did a motivation? And the handler couldn't think of it. We added motivation again to that dog training and the dog stopped crittering. You know, th these are supposed to be fun. They're not going to run the whole trail. My dog doesn't run the trail. I'm walking a good pace after we get into a distance trail. But at the end, he runs his motivation. You know, when I do a training exercises, most of my training exercises incorporate motivation because, you know, that we're teaching them, this is how you trail. You trail with focus, motivation, like Bernard is talking about. And you can maintain it for a long period of time when you need to. So, and it's got to be fun for the dog. It's, it's absolutely yeah. got to be fun. If it's not fun, don't forget, guys, dogs never understand urgency of search. It's not a concept they get. They only understand the game. So, if you don't make it fun for the dog, the dog won't work. It's really that simple. It's gotta, you got to make it fun for the dog. Well, maybe, Monica, you're on mute. Monica, you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah, I always talk uh, about three, like three pillars uh, uh, of uh, when building a dog. It's motivation, emotion, and structure. We have to think about this always. A good, uh, a good dog is motivated dog with always positive emotions. We, we are working with emotions as well. And then a good structure, which is what the method gives you. So I think with these three things in mind, we can really build a very good dog. Yeah. So I also think, Sorry? because the question is why we're always running. Um, we are not always running. That's not no. the, the target of the game. But if a dog is high motivated to find, he will speed up 
that's all. So you will see when you go on a cold trail or on a real case trail, uh, the dog doesn't speed up like an intensity. But on an intensity, it's naturally behavior for the dog uh, to speed up because he wants to find the runner. So you have to control the speed. I have a, a 40 kilo German Shepherd. So when I have to control the speed, I put the leash behind me. And when I walk this way, I put my whole weight against this, uh, the, the, leash, the leash of the Shepherd and then it works. But this is uh, the, the speed. This is something you have to find for yourself. This is uh, for the team. Uh, the runner must be able to uh, go with the speed of the dog and then it works. If the dog is fa too fast and you always have to break him down or to slow down the speed, um, it's not good for the dog and it's also not good for the runner. So you have to find your speed for your team. That's all. Yeah. And if you see, I mean, this is this is something that we we're fighting with a little bit on some of the people that we we are training with. You see them going from control and they're starting to come up. And they're not leaning back as much and they're starting to come up and they're right at that verge of losing control. You if you're at that point, you got to slow down. You cannot run that fast. You got to be able to stop these dogs on the dime. If you cannot stop your dog at, on a dime, you're out of control. You're running out of control. And then you, the, whole, the whole point of the intensity is pointless because what we, what we haven't mentioned yet is that, yes, this is motivational for the dog. What is, this, what is the intensity trail doing for the handler? Well, the intensity trail for the handler is teaching them what your dog's negatives are. You should be seeing some kind of negative and starting to learn how to read your dog on trail. And if you don't see that, something is wrong with your intensity. You need to, this is the time that you learn how to read your dog is with intensities. And if your dog is too fast and you have problems, you cannot focus on anything else than your speed. And you, you just don't, cannot see the dog working because you're too worried about, because your dog is pulling too much. So you have to really try to balance this because if your dog is pulling and pulling and you're just stop slowing your dog down, you have a problem because you cannot read the dog because you're just worried that you're not gonna fall because that's happened to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had a dog that pulled very strongly and I had problems because I could not focus on anything else, but uh, slowing my dog down and, and paying attention not to fall down. And not face planting. I think we've all face planted. <laughs> well, I, I, I've, I've fallen from on behind on my butt and my elbows and it hurts so much. Yeah. But yeah, once you get the right speed with your dog, then you can watch the negatives and everything. Yeah, so that, that is important. Understand that this is, that's the training for the handler because Ultimately, we're not going to be, you, you are doing intensities for the rest of the dog's life, but you are going to be doing, uh, running other types of trails and you're going to be doing, even in team training, you're going to be do, doing longer trails. So you need to understand what your dog is telling you, what these negatives are. Is it a flowing negative? Is it a cutback or the trailing circle? You need to understand all that. And this helps. It really helps. So if you don't know, if you don't know that, read that in the book. That's, there's a whole chapter in there about the negative indications. And I want to add just one more thing about um, this, the starts and this issue of dog being overly excited. You know, so what do you do? So I, I've got the dog uh, in a position, the trail runner leaves, I bring the dog around, the dog is really excited. I have to wait till the runner gets in position. So during that time, what I can do, and I've seen people, they just, um, um, you know, part of being here is knowing what to do, right? And so if my dog is, is not that excited because he's just learning, I'm patting him on his side, you know? Oh, we're gonna go get him, we're gonna find him, you know? And if a dog is over the top and too excited, I'm patting him from the back I'm of the down. head all the way down to the tail and saying, calm, calm, and the calming him down a little bit so I can get him in a state where he can focus and work the trail with his nose. And, but at the same time, you know, I've seen people, they wait too long to get the dog started and they put the dog in obedience. They might put them in a sit or a down, 
Now the dog is focused on you and we don't want that. We want the dog to stay focused the trail. And so these little things that happen can make a big difference for the dog. You know, I had a, a handler who would put the dog in a sit and every, and I could see as soon as the dog went into a sit, the dog started looking up at the handler and it made a huge difference in the dog. And I'm like, okay, let's no sit. Let the dog just be, you know, at, on the leash, be ready to go. And then the starts were wonderful. These little tiny things that we, we employ, you know, make a huge difference for them. So it's fun about, it's fun learning like what works best for my dog, but most of the information you get is really by looking at your dog, you know, looking at your dog and go it's way too excited. He's really not, he's kind of distracted by something, say a big semi truck went by and now the dog is a little bit concerned. You know, you can do things that will help the dog be successful. And you can also restart an intensity if you have to restart the intensity. So nobody says you have to keep moving forward. You know, a lot of times, this is a totally different subject, so I'm not going to go there. But, um, but, but, but that, those are things that you can do to get your dog in the right, you know, um, balance, a, a good balanced motivation, not over the top and not distracted by something else. So. And again, like you, like you had said, if, there's, yes. if the intensity is not to your liking, make sure you make it to your liking, run another intensity too. You can run one right after this, that last one. Usually when we do intensities, um, we have some pork liver dogs. I don't know what we're gonna have with these porcelains, but we have um, in, my, in the bag, I have two little tiny pieces of pork liver and then one big one. Cause I'm anticipating that I may have trouble on one of my intensities that I have to have another intensity before I give the dog the big piece. So always remember you're in charge. If it doesn't look right, if you didn't get your ID, if the dog sight hunted, all of these things should be a reason why you should do another intensity. Don't be lazy and say, oh, well, okay, it, it looks like it's okay. If, you, if a little part of you thinks that it's not right, do it, do another one. Uh, I want something to add to Chris. You have to different. Um, there's a, a natural behavior of the dog he has or have not, and then it's a learned behavior of the dog. So take care in which uh, situation you start the dog on the trail. Um, if you don't care about this, and the dog is always excited in this moment and not focused on the trail, the dog will learn uh, learn, we learn this behavior. The dog will never start in a good way. So you have to take care. Always wait when the dog is in the right situation you want the dog to be, then start. Then the dog will also learn this. This is learned behavior of the dog. You have to, you can use it. And the second thing is uh, what is uh, also in the Kocher method, a very good tool to control this. This is the delay start. Uh, so when you go away with the dog, if you have a very excited dog and you go away with the dog and come back to the, the start again, when the runner is away, then you can push down the, the excitement of the dog a little bit. This is a very good tool for example, for the high driven dogs. Uh, so you could push down the excitement a little bit. And uh, this is a very good thing described also in the book in the, the delay start yeah. intensity. I just, um, just one thing, one little note on that. Um, I still, even the high driven crazies, like we have one on our team, um, I would still start them off with a intensity versus a delayed start because even on the delayed start, if she's not doing what she should be doing, that dog is still not concentrating. So <laughs> like, she's gotta get that dog focused on what we're doing and calm and like Chris had said soothe the dog top to bottom make you know calm easy we're gonna we're gonna work easy but again no you got to know your dog everybody's got a different dog so you we can't there is no one exact answer for everybody we have Here. a question from Danielle asking uh, which distance is recommended for the intensity yeah I mean again well, I was saying that the dog should be, I never really actually timed it, but the dog should be like doing an intensity for about 30, 30 seconds to a minute, I think. 
any longer than that, that's not an intensity. So it's hard to put a distance on because you got a little dog that runs slower or a big dog that runs real fast. How do you put an actual distance on it? Uh, uh, yeah, no, an actual distance on it. So they were asking for a distance. Right, well, you want it so long, we are, long enough. We're, yeah, so we're it. saying that you want it long enough. Go ahead. Right, long enough that the dog has to use his nose, but short enough that it's, it's, it's fun, that it's still fun for the dog. If you make it, you know, two or three blocks, your dog's going to, you know, he's going to start losing, losing, especially the newer dogs, they're going to start losing interest. You know, it's got to, but you got to make sure that it's going to be long enough that they're going to have to put that nose down and you got to see them working it. We, we've seen the, we've seen people go both ways, but more often than not, we see people doing too short of an intensity. And again, that can work, that could be counterproductive because then the dog is not lose, using their nose. If they know that my subject is only going to be, you know, whatever, a uh, hundred feet away, some of these dogs won't use their nose at all. They'll just like kind of fly out, head up nothing on the ground and oh there's my subject Woohoo! they've learned absolutely nothing also uh we didn't talk about this yet uh make sure when you do intensities that you put a turn in it the reason why is we want to make sure that that dog is using the nose and if they're not using it they're going to blow that turn <laughs> but they should be using their nose and you can assure yourself that they are if they do the turn and that they're not uh, free training I out i also think uh, the distance uh, depends on the dog. Um, yeah. So there are different dogs, and for every dog, it's a different distance. The most important thing is the distance should be as long as the dog uses his nose. So if you have a dog, he, he uses his nose from beginning, from start away, uh, from start from the beginning, then you can do the reward very fast. If you have a dog, who is uh, hunting with the eyes and see very much. And then after a little time, he goes down and uh, use his nose. Then you need a no longer distance. The point is reward the dog for using his nose. This is the most important point of the intensity. So the, it's not, it depends not on the length uh, of, the, of the distance of the intensity. It depends on this, the dog use his nose or not. So if the dog use the nose and search along the trail, then reward him. So this depends of the dog. Some dogs are faster, some dogs are slower. I hope the other thing I want to add to that, um, in terms of nose is the reward. When we, when we talk about the reward, you want to use a high level reward and that can be enhanced you know, by the excitement of the trail runner. You know, the trail runner getting excited, and like Monica talked about, some dogs might not like that. So you have to know what the dog likes in terms of, you know, what kind of reward is really going to make it worthwhile for the dog to use its nose to find you. But the other thing is, you, you know, you want to make sure, especially in the beginning, and I really try to set up all the exercises so that with dogs that are newer to the game, that they don't see the person at the end. Because at the end, you don't want your dog to come in see the person and then go and get rewarded. I want the dogs to use their dog, their nose all the way to the find. And they find the person hiding in the bushes, you know, hiding, you know, just inside a door that's open, you know, but make it an easy find, but make it invisible find, you know, have those people be invisible. So the dog uses the nose all the way, because what you'll see after a while, especially if you, and people tend to run patterns in terms of length of their trails and that sort of thing, the dog will stop and look, stop and look, because they've found per people by seeing them at the end. So try to set it up so that the dog is 100% nose from the beginning to the end. I think we have a question here that this, uh, she asks, is intensity trail motivation trail? Yes. No? Yeah. But we don't only do it uh, in the start of the learning process. We do it the whole life of the dog. Yes. Because, right. yeah, yeah. We, we want the dog to keep in mind that this is the funniest and the best game ever. So we uh, want to... As, as I explained first at the beginning, 
uh, remember, this is a little high motivated hunt. This is natural for the dog and he can live his natural in this dwelling situation, in this intensity. Also the whole life. Yeah, I've even used the intensity. Uh, this has been uh, interesting have the um, a seminar, we lay the trail on the first day, we run it on the last day, you know, so now it's almost three, three days old. A lot of people have never run that before, you know, so what we'll do is we'll run an intensity on the trail layer before we go to the start, before we get the dog going, we have the dog run intensity, take the same scent article, now go to the beginning of that three day old trail and the dog is very motivated. Nice starts, clean starts. You know, even though it's an age trail, it's the same odor, it's the same scent article, and it really sets the handler up for success. And, you know, cause a lot of, you know, our training is for the handlers, you know, but, too. But, because yeah, and dog... this happens because with the intensity, we give a dog a very positive emotion and the dog yeah. goes, finishes with that emotion and then does the, the old trail but he has this motion of finding that same scent. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. That's a very, and very exciting. The handlers walk into it, you know, seeing that start and being very confident in their dogs and what they're doing. And they drop some of their kind of nervousness about the, doing an age trail. So I will, I will do these age trails, like three blocks in a city block, you know, where there's traffic and where there's people and where it's, all this stuff is going on. And these intensities really help at the starts. So, you know, they are the best tool in the toolbox. I mean, they're the, they're the foundation. They're the foundation for this program, that's for sure. Yeah. Hey, I wanted to mention quickly, because we're talking about intensity trails, and this is an important part of it. At the end, when the dog gets the reward, I get that you as the subject are excited about the fact that the dog has, has found, and the handler as well, but saying something too early before there's a final a final trained indication or some kind of ID can lead to a problem. Now you have to have some kind of ID of some sort or at least be working on it. You don't want to wait, you don't want to wait out the dog. If you have a sit ID, you're not going to sit there and wait. But the problem that we are seeing is that a lot of people as they're approaching the subject, they're like, yay! The dog hasn't even done the identification or jump up, sit, anything. So make sure to be aware of that and keep the mouth quiet until the dog does the ID, especially if you have a trained indication, you gotta be quiet. <laughs> No, I know, right? Everybody's being quiet. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I I think, Chris, you had brought up the fact yeah. uh, you, you wanted to bring something up here on this yeah. subject. I wanted to say, I've seen this a few times in the seminars, and, and that is people are focused too much too soon on the ID. You know, the dog hasn't really gotten a great foundation for this is a wonderful game, and they get rewarded at the end, and they start to insert the trained response. Um, too soon and it takes the dog away from the reward and is now doing obedience you know you can do obedience separate from the the trail ending and you can do a, a progression to teach that um train response at the end but really be careful that you don't start doing it too soon and the dog you've just wrecked the dog's reward you know so um and this There's is going a, for your 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 obedience like identifications, such as the sit ID, not the jump up. Jump up is pretty natural. Yeah. It's easy to, to easy to solicit that. But if, if you're doing, doing a sit. sit ID, if you're if you're extending that time and sit, 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 we're not rewarding the trail. You're only now rewarding the sit, and the connection on the whole thing is now lost. The other, thing, um, the, the other thing that about the reward at the end, and we all get so excited about the trail, 
and myself included, I'm guilty. We want to start talking about what we saw, what the dog did, and the party's not over yet. You know, so a lot of times I will time the reward and I'll say, okay, everybody's getting a 30 second reward at the end, you know, and I'll time it and I'll have the little, little dinger go off after 30 seconds because it's really easy just to not finish the reward. You know, we give the dog the toy or the food, but we haven't got done praising the dog, you know, except for those dogs that really don't like a lot of attention from people. That's not very many, but um, most dogs really like you know, the reward. And, and I always encourage people, reward the dog all the way back to the car. Run to the car, play with the dog, tell them what a great job they did, you know, and that that is um, what they're doing the work for, is what they're getting at the end. So we don't want to short change them on that. As instructors, we have to refrain sometimes from commenting the trail once it finishes. Because it's true that we want we we need to explain everything, and we should don't repeat it. it. Don't repeat it. It's okay. <laughs> okay. There is a question yeah, here. How big, how big should the reward be at the end of trail prior to intensity? Big. How big? <laughs> Yeah, you have I to think yeah. there are two two things. Uh, when I uh, when I on trail and I have some uh, components and I train some components, then I tell my dog, okay, if he uh, uh, solve the issue we have or the barrier, then I say, okay, this is right we have done. This is very good. Yes, but at the end, remember the sheet, uh, not not the sheet, but remember catching the rabbit, eating the rabbit and bring the back home. Don't forget this, this is the end of the trail. So the reward at the end of the trail must be very big for the dog. Mm -hmm. This is what I wanna, uh, just... Kevin wrote in the, in, in, in the book with the big party at the end. Right. And I like, and I, I like the idea of the, uh, the trail runner doing the primary reward. You know, I've seen a lot of people rewarding their own dogs but the dog is not trailing you. The dog is trailing the, tra the trailer, you know, the trail runner. So have the reward come from the trail runner. The, you know, even if I'm carrying the reward, I give it to my runner at the end and let the, dog, let the runner give the dog the reward. It comes from the person they're trailing. Mm -hmm. They give the primary. And then I do the secondary reward. Oh, you did a good job. You know, and I take him to the car and praise him up and everything. But I really like to have, the excitement, the initial reward come from that trail runner themselves. So remember, the dog hunts the rabbit. So if I give, as a dog handler, the food uh, to the dog at the end as a reward, the dog will not understand the game because the reward is the person he wants to find. He has the reward. This is the reason why the dog hunts this person because he has the reward. So the reward should be given to the dog by the uh, by the runner. That's that's the point. A very simple thing. I think she she asks also. Uh, um, I mean, she says uh, prior to the last intensity. I think maybe if you plan to run a lot of intensities, like an extended trail, you give a small amount. A, a small amount, a small amount, and then the big one. I don't know if she has, she's asking this. Well, I think yeah, I'm kind of like coming in the middle of this because I missed a lot. But if it's a ball reward, you, it's really difficult to give, give the dog a ball in the middle of um, breaks. It breaks that whole string of them, and then it doesn't become one long trail. So, a lot of people that have toy reward dogs, they're showing the ball or showing the toy at at the, the first intensity, at, at the first intensity, and then taking off again, and then they give it to them on the last one. I don't know if that answers the question, but um, for example, we, we use a little trick. We have some sausage or cheese. We put into a little uh, quarters or pieces and when I'm the runner I have the box with the food and I have one of these pieces in my hand when the dog comes he gets the first reward from the piece of my hand uh, then the dog handler tells me as a runner 
Yes, the dog was good. Then he tells me jackpot. Then I put the box out and reward the dog. Or he tells me because there was some issue on the trail and I would do a next trail, a next intensity. And then he told me, okay, once again, an intensity. Okay, then show the dog the box, tease the dog and run away. Uh, so this is a very simple uh, handling trick. You can uh, solve these problems. Um, don't, the, the, the rewards between two intensities with a, a toy, it's not so good because the toy I have to tell the dog to leave this toy, to give this toy away again. And this is a, for the dog a bad emotion because he have to, he, now he has his dog, his rabbit, and then he has to give it again to the runner. This is not so good. So with the food, it's easier for the dog. And at the end of the trail, when there is a checkbook, you give the whole food to the dog and then they can play with the toy or everything. So can they do the big party? It's a very simple trick. You can solve such issues. Also something that I think it's important is that when we run a second intensity after an exercise, make sure that the dog sees the runner going away. So make sure that the, 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 the runner teases again the dog so that the dog knows that the rabbit is running away again. Because sometimes yeah. people go in a hurry and the dog thinks it's finished and doesn't understand. So make sure you show the reward again to the dog and go. Yeah, that's that's real important when we're working, especially with new people, because in search and rescue, you have like a little bit of a revolving door sometimes. So you got new people coming in and then they want to hide for the dogs and they don't really understand everything. And they're not making that connection with the dog. The dog is busy eating something from the last, the you know, the last reward. And then they're running away and the dog has no idea what just happened. Exactly, and yeah. again, I always tell you guys, the handler is in charge of the exercise. If you see something is wrong, call that person back. Get back here. Tease my dog up correctly. Don't just do that. I don't know if somebody wants to add uh, something else. Yeah, well, on this, on, on That's this, the on, one I was responding to. Yeah, on this question, you know, you know, they say they give, give the ball to the runner. The runner throws the ball and then yeah. takes the ball back and then runs for the intensity. I would not throw the ball because now you, you just made it two, you made it two trails. It wasn't one trail. It's not one trail. When that dog finds the runner and get, you get the ID, don't give him the ball. Just show him that you have the ball. You still have the ball and tease him and then go again. At the second intensity, if it's all good, then you give him the ball. Don't give him the ball after the first intensity because you're, now you're giving you're, you're giving him the ball and taking it back, and now you've just made two trails out of it. Another thing, by the way, for this, well, I, I, this is important when with foundational stuff. If you have a food reward dog, get in the habit of having food in your pocket, also. The same smell should be on you and should be on your runner. And this will follow through as you go through the book and we start talking about no scent identifications. These smart dogs start to figure out, hmm, yeah, my handler's got the food. So I have an idea on you. So make sure if, you're, if you are the handler and you have a food reward dog, you have a little piece of food in your pocket at all times and your runner has food as well. So many it's interesting uh, tips and little things that can improve our trainings. That's great. And something that I recommend um, to people is that once the dog gets the game and the dog's doing really well, um, we don't want to have the cue of the food or the reward on the, on the person. Because as they're walking, they're laying odor of that cue, whether it's food or the toy. And then also at the end, in terms of ID, when the dog is identifying somebody, we're cueing the dog if you're holding the, the food or if you're holding the reward. So, and you'll see a lot of times that, you know, the dogs have a difficult time, you know, cueing or uh, re, um, identifying somebody if they don't have food, if they're used to having food all the time. So I eventually take the food away from the trail runner I take the toy away from the trail runner and I give it to him at the end, you know, so the dog is running a clean trail without having additional help of smelling the food or smelling the toy. 
So, you know, because they'll use whatever they can to help them. You know, dogs are, are going to associate things together, you know, yeah. and um, so you don't want to create a problem by having them use that as a, as a cue for too long. So I, I take it out of the picture and, and still maintain a nice, good, happy reward with good timing. I just let my trail runners know, I'll hand you the reward. I'll hand you the food. I'll hand you the toy. And then you party with my dog. Yeah. I, I mean, I do it as, um, I do it as a variable thing. So I say, okay, out of every 10 or 15 of them, we're going to, we're not going to have the trail layer, have the reward at the end and then add it in because it's very difficult to do an intensity without having the runner tease up with the reward and now they have it in their hand unless they drop it off someplace but i we we've put it in like one in every 10 trainings or you know just to mix it up to keep the dogs honest <laughs> and we found that that has worked i have another question from a, a girl that i know <laughs> shall i read it I have a question about getting back in the car after a trail. My, my dog, Lenya, um, and knows the job, loves, loves the reward, but doesn't like to get back in the car. She does, but sometimes I'm afraid that point will affect future trails. In other contexts, she has no problem being alone in the car. It's not her favorite situation, but she accepts it. Do you have any tip, tips to improve the moment of getting back in the car? She doesn't want to get back in the car because she just had so much fun. <laughs> you know, the, the, our dogs, you know, our dogs hate getting back in the car. I mean, they take their time coming when they get near the truck. They see the truck in the they walk real slow. Yeah, they slow down. They, they don't want to really get back there. Heidi's dog, she will throw her her toy into the water because into then, the water bowl, into the water bowl and drink the water. And they, they just lollygag around the truck. They don't want to get back in. But, you know, they get back in. They, they, you do have to get them back in, and they will get back in. They just don't like to, because they just had so much fun. There's really not much you can do about it. I mean, I haven't seen it to be an issue. I don't right. know if any of you guys have seen it. To be an maybe issue. give her a treat or something. Maybe give her a treat when they. Oh yeah, you can throw, yeah, yeah, throw a treat. treat and, yeah, throw a treat. I mean, into yeah, that, the crate, into the crate yeah. or whatever. Yeah, to get the dog to go in. Oh, you but, think yeah. this Cookie Monster does not give his? Dogs... I always have cookies yeah. in my pocket, <laughs> yeah. so you know. <laughs> All the dogs get cookies when they go into the crate. <laughs> but it helps to get them in the crate, and especially <laughs> in, the, in the truck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any? Uh, maybe, maybe the question is why the dog don't want to go into the car again? Because she, well, the dog <laughs> likes to do once more in intensity or once more a trail, because the dog is so motivated and wants to play the game again. So. Put the dog into the car, wait a few minutes, and take it out and run in intensity again. Put the dog into the car, wait a few minutes, take it out and run in intensity again. Then the dog will learn that to put in the car is only a break a little bit. So for the dog, it's easier. He knows when he goes into the car, we are not driving home. Maybe we do a next intensity. That's the, you, know, you have to understand why the dog doesn't want to go into the car. This is the main point to solve this issue. Okay. Anybody else have anything? Where did Jackie go? Oh, there's Jackie. <laughs> it's Anybody interesting. Just, it's interesting talking about this because if this points out how different the dogs are. You know, we had dogs that mm -hmm. when they get their reward at the end, and it's always a toy reward for police dogs, they run to the car because that's their cave. They're taking the rabbit and they're running to the cave. You know, it's wow. just it, there. We have different breeds, you know, different dogs that do this work, and you just have to set it up for them, you know. Yeah, I mean, my hound. I was challenged way back when, and was was told if you have a bloodhound, you will never get that dog to be a toy reward dog. I was like, oh, that sounds like a challenge. So when I got Bella. I started her right away. Now, obviously this wasn't, you know, she wasn't born with this kind of drive, but I got her to start doing tugging with me and to, I mean, she's still here now. And when, when we, when we run a trail, it's a little piece of food and she can tug for 30 minutes 
or more. I remember having a whole conversation with Kevin one time and she just sat there, tug, 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 tug for 30 minutes. And then we went back to the car and the same thing. She drops that thing right in the water bowl because she doesn't want to get back in the car. <laughs> I mean, to, one of the things we do, we started here is, um, and, and Heidi, I've seen you some you know about it. He used uh, a, that bag, that prey dummy, and we attach a rope to it. So with the food reward dogs, it is, is it's, it's, it's that hunt and that having that food that Bernie is talking about. Um, so they'll get their food and we'll present this bag to them. So they learn to tuck. They, they, that is, that is their piece of the hunt. And with those food reward dogs, having that reward bag on the tuck, that you can tug with them all the way back to the vehicle and they want to get in there with them. Um, so yeah, just because it's not a toy doesn't mean it can't go all the way. Well, Jackie has made us the little, uh, you've had, what was, what's Neely, right? She made us Neely, those little, yeah. oh my gosh, they have in Africa, they have these amazing bags uh, for their hounds and um, they have a great zipper on it and you put the food in it and it becomes, it's a treat bag, but it also becomes a tug and you can really play with the hounds like that. And they got some animation on those bloodhounds. I mean, this, this one bloodhound that uh, was in Africa. I mean, he almost jumped as high as I am, you know, like three feet up in the air, trying to run after that thing. <laughs> There's some of them that you, they, we actually had one swallow one the other day, Heidi, luckily he pooped it out <laughs> because he wouldn't want to let go of it by the time he got to the car. So we, but um, luckily it didn't end in a bad way. <laughs> yeah. But it is interesting, Chris. So your dogs, um, when they bring back the reward, they actually are allowed to bring the toy into their kennel with them, or do they have to drop the reward before they go into their kennel? They take it in there with them, but the the handler eventually takes it out. But they have gotcha. okay. They use um, uh, big pieces of fire hose, so it's a tug toy basically, mm -hmm. and it's a pretty good size. They can't swallow it or anything. And, and if they tend to shred it up or chew it, they don't get to hold onto it very long. <laughs> yeah. So there, there's the difference. And we don't allow the dogs to bring it into their crates or their kennels. They have to leave it. And then they go into the kennel and then that's quiet time. They have their water outside and you guys are bringing it in. So <laughs> yeah, that, there's a little bit of the difference. There's no wrong or right way, guys. <laughs> on that you want to have your dog have it in the kennel that's fine yeah after the, after the trail only yeah. <laughs> not generally I'll say too that you know sometimes you know dogs will get tired of getting the same reward all the time you know they might really like you know getting one certain type of food reward but then changing it up is oftentimes a good idea you know and for some dogs there's a big difference between hot dogs and bacon you know they might not work so hard for a hot dogs, but they will work like crazy for bacon. You know, so these are things that we have to really consider. And I know that um, it's probably like the number one thing that I look at when I look at working with people and their dogs and looking at motivation is what is the dog's response to the reward? We might think it's a great reward, but the dog might be telling you otherwise. You know, so I always give them what they like. I know my dog likes change. You know, so sometimes I give cheese, sometimes bratwurst, you know, I always pair it up with a lot of petting because he loves being petted, you know, so um, you got to make it interesting and fun, you know. Yeah, there so. are, I, I, yeah, there's plenty of dogs out there that like that, that you think you have a reward and then two months into it, the dog's like, I don't want this stuff no more. <laughs> I want something else. <laughs> We got lucky with our guys. They 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 were into pork liver. I don't know about these porcelains. We gave them pork liver, and they went for the they went for the squeaky tug. We'll see. <laughs> well, this has been great. I know that um, I'm. Uh, I love getting questions. I love getting videos. If anybody wants to send me any information, um, please do so. We can do so much now with with Zoom and with the technology that we have. You know, I've helped people train overseas with Zoom, you know, which is great. And with videos that they send. 
So um, there's all kinds of resources out there. And, and this organization has a number of really good experienced people. Right. Yeah. And we all learn from each other. I, I think as, um, as instructors, it's so amazing to just speak to each one of you guys. And, you know, we, when we do these Zoom meetings, I think we all walk away from so with something. <laughs> Anybody got anything else? We should try to do another one in the next uh, next month or next couple mm -hmm. of months. Yeah. yeah. And what's the topic of the next one? Monica, do you remember what it was? I, I, my, oh. I, I have puppy brain. I'm sorry. Oh. I'm going to blame everything on the puppies. Um, no, but a lot of things come to my mind. Because I, I think of, um, delayed intensity and think, reading your dog, reading the negatives. Yeah, those were two were two of the primary things. Delayed intensity is very valuable. I mean, I, I not use it yeah, enough. Yeah. And people don't understand the reason why we need it. The delayed mm -hmm. start. Yeah. So that's that that would that should be great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's I, what I, that's a, yeah, we'll, and then we'll one. talk about a lot that. Of people stop doing that or don't do enough of it or don't do it at all. So exactly, yeah. exactly. So I guess, yeah, for next time we'll We'll talk about the delayed start and we'll, we'll see what else. And if you have the book, come to the Zoom meeting, have, having read the delayed start. If you have a dog, try the delayed start. This way you're already coming with the, the knowledge that's in the book, the experience of doing it. And you can, have, you can have some more questions for us or maybe we'll clear up some things for you, but at least you, you're, have, you have dip dived into the subject of delayed start intensities. And I will put a video together, a video of someone doing a delayed start. So we'll have a visual of that. Perfect. That's Maybe awesome. a couple. I, I think, yeah, yeah, do it, please. <laughs> yes, with Jake. I have a, a, a few on my YouTube channel, but it's in Spanish. But if you can do something in English or something that we can see, that would be great. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. All right. Well, everybody, thank you so much yep. for good seeing everyone. For thank, you. Yes. thank you to yeah. all the instructors. Yes, thank great, you. Great seeing you guys all. Yes, Jackie, absolutely. if you're available on the next one, um, we want okay. you to be a part of us. Yeah, Hello. just just me, uh, Thanks for letting me in on this, Monica. Yeah, I was yeah. actually just wanting to join as a spectator, but um, next time, let me know when you're going to have it, and I can tell you whether I can join or not. Let, let me see your faces. Let's see your faces now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Remember everybody's name, but I love seeing faces. Yeah. <laughs> or your dogs. If we see your dogs, we'll probably remember. Darlene. And I, I know Darlene? I Dar I know Darlene can't um can't do the video, but she's um she's here. Well, I don't know. Not not anymore. Oh, there she is. Yeah. Darlene's still here. So she's one of our instructors. Um, so I want to, to add something important, think maybe. So look at the uh, homepage of the web seat from impti.com. So look at the instructors. There are some instructors who have an own blog in the internet. You can read this blog. The example, I have a blog in the internet. It's in German, but you can translate this with Google. So we can, so Monica, I know she has a blog. Yes, uh, in Spanish. <laughs> Spanish, but you can translate it. We just started, we didn't start a blog. We're not that technical, but we started a Facebook page on with um, yes. with these uh, porcelains. So you guys can go through, watch our training with these two little guys that we're going to be doing. And we're going to be showing everything from socialization with the SAR twist to um, obedience, to a little bit of agility, everything. Uh, pertaining to man trailing because all of it all ties into it so okay bye everyone bye, thank you bye. 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 see you thank you everyone thank you bye bye